man, this is Deion Dawkins, man, and you're listening to The Scoop on OwlScoop.com. You already should know. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Scoop, OwlScoop.com's podcast, Season 7, Episode 40. I am John DiCarlo, joined by Sam Cohn. Dante Colinelli. And how long has it been, Javon Edmonds? A, a, a few weeks, a month? Maybe pushing a month. The most important yeah. thing is you're back with us and we're, we're I very think, excited. I think that because this is Javon's first episode back in a reasonable amount of time, we should just go around and tell our favorite Javon stories. <laughs> Don't embarrass me. Is this the sequel Javon. to tell our favorite Kyle story? Yeah, exactly. you missed the Next Kyle Bur- you missed the Kyle Dante birthday stories. episode when Kyle Kyle logged into the you know the the Google Doc on the script. It was like it's Kyle's birthday. Everyone say what they like about Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> what's your? Fa- I, have, I mean, I have I have lots of favorite Javon stories. Sam, what's your favorite Javon story? I have a, very much a favorite Javon story, but that's not a story I can tell. On the pod. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, oh, I'll, no, I'll tell, I'll tell a funny Javon story. Okay. John, it's a story that you always find funny. Mm-hmm. Um, there was one time, and we're not naming names in the story, but there was one time where I went into the WHIP studio and it was just Javon and someone else in there. Uh, and person A was telling Javon about all of their deep deep relationship life problems and i see javon just sitting there with his hand in his palm just yeah nice yeah trying to be trying to be really nice but just clearly like get me out of here i don't care i don't want to hear about this and this person is really which is divulging your entire life and out of character for javon because he is a good listener great listener he i mean he handled the situation very well but i was like this doesn't sound like something javon wants to be listening to and it gave me a it gave me a quick chuckle and then i left i just i I was very uh attentive to the story i just didn't care about it i'm i'll just be honest (laughs) i just didn't and sam picked it up immediately i just i enjoyed talking to javon about music there was this tweet about uh, a house down the block just like blasting elder barge the one one day and i said what song were they playing and just without hesitation he just writes back rhythm of the night i was like that's <laughs> good song great song that's awesome way great to start song. the morning yeah yeah could have been who's johnny something like I think, that i think my favorite javon story is him arguing with mina kimes on twitter Ugh. oh that's a classic that's a good one because all mina did was say watch the clip in all lowercase letters so if any of our listeners are not familiar, go on Twitter, advanced search and search at Javon, whatever Javon's Twitter handle is and at whatever Mina Kimes handle is, and it'll come up. And Javon's gone back with Mina Kimes on Twitter once or twice. So it's, you'll get a, you'll get a quick chuckle out of it. Why have, I said that? Why have I said that twice in this podcast? I don't like that. But it's like the word chuckle. Yeah. We'll Javon's a takesman. He is a, he is a, he is a, <laughs> a, a season takesman on Twitter. <laughs> I, 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 I'm opinionated. I'll concede to that. I'm opinionated. Yes. Well, um, this ooh. episode, we, uh, we have Javon back. We don't have LeBron. No, I just was going to say that. So LeBron James did not respond to Sam's request to be on the scoop when LeBron tweeted something a few days ago about, what do you say, either starting a podcast or being on a podcast. Sam tweeted at him and, you know, Nothing. Gentle, gentle pleaded to join the scoop. Yeah. Shockingly. We never heard anything back. I might have gone the wrong route. Maybe if I invite him to the Alice Scoop barbecue instead of the actual pod, then maybe we get, you know, get some of Tom's um, Tom's food in him. And then we'll see. Then we get well, Sam, you know, you got to talk to man and rich before you even think about talking to Bron. So, yeah, you know. exactly. There's there's pathways to go through. First, I'll get on the shop. <laughs> and then and then I'll get to LeBron. So then so LeBron, Rich Paul and Adele all show up to the Alscoop Barbecue in Havertown, Pennsylvania. And Javon says, I should have brought a date. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to Javon, I was like, it's not that big a deal. <laughs> like, Newman had me pressured. I like, th- 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 you know, somebody brings up one, then you feel like you have to bring one. Yeah. So our next, our next big guest will hopefully be Adam Sandler. 
Um, I told you, hustle came out today. I told you to reach out. There's a temple reference there. Aaron McKee makes a brief cameo. You failed us by not getting us Adam Sandler on the pod, but we'll see. A day is still young. Uh, famous number forties guys. I have a couple names in there. Don't, don't cheat. Well, all right, well, okay. that's a good one. What? I say, while people are thinking, I would like to throw out the take that the number 40, 40 to 49, all bad numbers. They're not good. Why do you say that? Hey, listen, listen, listen. It's, it's, a, a, who... hor- it's a horrible aesthetic. Can I, I don't know why. Every time I look, I except for like Jackie Robinson and 42. I was going like to say 42. the only exception to that bad aesthetic. That yeah. is it. Like I think I might have every, something for you. Every third string tight end is like number 48. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Yeah, 45, 45 is not bad, but it's a little blocky. Javon just got up yeah, on yeah. Zoom. He said, I'm, I think I might have something for you. Uh, he oh, has yeah. a jersey, putting the earbuds back in. Oh, my Javon God. He was, was number 45. He was number 45. All right. Wow. What did I just say? I said 45. 45. Okay. 45 <laughs> is a good number, Javon. Javon that, looks like a, that looks like a Little League World Series jersey. Uh, we, we weren't quite that good. We had a uh, <laughs> lot of degenerate Baltimore children, but we had some talent for us. <laughs> Yeah. Oh that was the best way to describe it jesus that's funny yeah well <laughs> oh man a harsh assessment of your roster yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey starting right fielder over here all right i, I think i may i might have let that league an outfield assist that year i, I, I very well may have don't run on vaughn no. no no don't the problem is my numbers were nowhere near what they could be because our catcher could not catch from out there so mm. I, so your advanced Scott, stats were all messed up. You know, yeah, exactly. You know, so yeah, we had a second baseman who like was not that good, but he was the the, the coach's son, so he started. And uh, I did not trust him to get the throw as the cutoff man, so I just go straight to home. I had the power and the accuracy, and uh, we had a catcher who couldn't catch. So my numbers were nowhere. But they imagine could. like a like an, a ten year old Javon Edmonds like playing like CYO or rec league basketball and just like criticizing his teammates and saying they don't have the drop step that Bill Russell had or something. <laughs> oh, don't bring up Bill Russell, John. Come on, of all people. It's like, I'm not seeing the fundamentals here, guys. I'm out. <laughs> Javon, who's Bill Russell? I don't know who you're talking about. Go home and watch the tape. <laughs> I'm not coming back tomorrow until you guys watch film. I can see it. I, I say this out of admiration too i mean dante gail sayers like one of the greatest running backs of all time yeah but how long ago was that like i like i don't know like feels like me, yesterday yeah well, <laughs> but it wasn't <laughs> but like i don't know like i wasn't alive me, to see him play so i don't know i don't know like for me like all those 40 numbers like i just think that they don't they don't look good bill ambeer bill ambeer the detroit pistons can't i can't do it i don't know so right. I don't, it's not, it's a personal thing. I think it's a personal decision. Yeah. Yes. It's tough. Yes. Anyway, it's a, a, a packed, packed episode of the scoop this week. We do have a lot of stuff to get to a lot of recruiting stuff. We will talk about Deuce Roberts temple's latest verbal commitment for basketball. We've got some audio clips uh, from him, from his conversation with Kyle Gauss. Um, uh, another official visit that's going on right now as we record this from the class of 2023. Uh, I talked to Stan Drayton yesterday about how their first three prospect camps have gone so far. Uh, in an interview that you will only hear on Al Scoop, we'll play a cup, we'll play a clip from my interview with Stan. Uh, Al Scoop subscribers can hear the full uh, or the majority of the interview on the site. Um, some other football recruiting updates, uh, pretty full mailbag. Uh, so we'll get right to it. We'll start with the Deuce Roberts verbal commitment. So this one, um, I would say that over the past few weeks, we had heard that they might be interested in adding a high school player from the Midwest. I can only assume that uh, Deuce Roberts was the player we're hearing about, um, but he's a relative unknown. I think Temple is obviously hoping they they can't comment on the record about him. He hasn't signed his national letter of intent just yet. Or I think at this point it would be like a, scholarship aid letter but uh can't get any comment yet from Aaron McKee they did get Ty, uh, Tosh Sweet signed uh we've talked about Tosh but uh Deuce is a six foot six or maybe six seven 180 pound combo guard from St. Michael the Archangel Catholic High School in Missouri um the story with him he was a two-time all-state selection uh but didn't have any any offers 
And so I think fans are saying, you know, how did this happen? You know, how did he, if he was that good, how did he, is he a diamond in the rough? Did he slip through the cracks? Any cliche you can think of, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, he took an official visit to Temple last week, committed on the official, uh, he, he told Kyle, and then he announced his decision on social media on Saturday. So he averaged uh, about 17 points, six rebounds, four assists, and almost two, two steals a game as a junior. And then following his senior season this year, uh, he played pretty well in the, in the Under Armour Rise sessions in April. He averaged a little bit more than 11, uh, 11 points, three rebounds, 1.7 steals there, uh, shot 38% from three-point range for the uh, Marcus Demon Elite Program. So again, um, before we before we get to um, kind of weighing in on this, uh, we'll play this first clip here uh, from Deuce Roberts talking to Kyle because again, this was um, this was a little bit out of nowhere. Again, he's in terms of rankings, in terms of having a lot of offers, which he didn't. This was this was a little bit of a, a relatively he's a little bit of a relatively unknown player around Missouri, around Kansas City. People know about him because again, he was a, a two time All State player. Um, but we're going to play this clip here. This first clip is Deuce talking to Kyle about how things came together with Temple. Uh, so it was great. Uh, it's been something I've been working for for the past four years. And to, to have Coach McKee and Temple University, University be the, the first school to take that chance on me, it, it feels amazing. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's kind of a, an obvious question, but how did uh, Temple get involved with a kid from Missouri? Uh, really, uh, connections. Uh, some of the coaches that I know, uh, know Coach Clark and a coach that I played with is, uh, is actually his uncle. And, uh, they reached out and just told them that you need to take a look at this kid. And, um, they did and sent over highlight tapes and stuff like that. And they, they just loved what they saw. So. That's that's really just what happened. It was just some guys in Kansas City who was just in my corner and were just trying to help me. They put my name in uh, Coach Clark's ear, and the rest is history. Do you know, um, you said one of the coaches was Chris Clark's uncle? Uh-huh. Do you know which coach that was? Um, He's a, one of my coaches that I played uh, with. His name is Leo Wright. Okay. Okay, so once you finally got that offer from Temple, uh, what would you kind of find out about the school, the university, the basketball program before you took your visit? I just uh, wanted to look into it. Um, I didn't know Coach McKee was the head coach there at first and kind of looked into it, wanted to see what the what the school was like. So I just did some research on uh, Coach McKee and really the, just the city of Philadelphia. I've never been to Philly uh prior to my uh, before my visit but i just uh just looked at that wanted to see what coach coach mckee was about and just what the city was about once you kind of dug into that and you saw that hey this guy played you know 13 years in the league was that kind of a an appealing aspect to you yes it, it was just because you know me and my dad we talk about playing for uh just a coach who has done what you want to, what you aspire to do. You know, every kid's dream. Well, most people uh, who play the sport, you know, it's a dream of theirs to play at that that level. And why not learn from someone who played there? You know, so that's that was really appealing to me. And also, he coached there too, so he also knows what it takes um, from the other perspective. He played as a player, and he was a coach. All right. So there he's talking about um, how Leo Wright, who's Chris Clark's uncle reached out to him and said, Hey, you guys have to take a look at this kid. Um, what do we, uh, well, uh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this now before we get to it. We have a couple more clips to play for you guys, but Sam Javon, what, what do you, what do you think of this? Is this a low risk, high reward type of pickup for temple? Again, I, I understand fans are saying, he didn't have a, didn't not only did he not have a ton of offers, he really didn't have Temple was his first D1 offer. So there's some skepticism there. The, the fan base wants every every player to be a four or five star player. I get that, um, but it seems here like they're they're investing themselves and saying, hey, it looks like the majority of the minutes are spoken for in the backcourt right now. 
this is a younger guy that we can bring along. Is that kind of how you guys see this? Yeah, I think uh, low risk, high rewards is a good way of putting it. Um, just based off his physical stature, he is the prototypical Aaron McKee guard. Uh, you look at that backcourt of Caleb Battle, Damien Dunn, what was Jeremiah Williams. He's all in on 6'5 and 6'6, big guards um, that can do a lot of different things. Obviously, High Sear Miller is um, the other piece. It's probably their day one, as of right now, probably their day one starting point guard. Uh, so I think he can, he can fit in as a guy that can maybe find a couple minutes or be a developmental guy in that backcourt behind. As you mentioned, they have a pretty a solidly established backcourt. You add, you know, minutes that Julio White's going to get um, at whatever position. You add, you know, Zach Hicks playing the three and four. Uh, so there, there's going to be some movement, but um, I think they have a pretty well-established backcourt. But about Deuce, I think it's fair to, to look at this and say, well, he didn't have any offers. Like, why would Temple... Um, why would Temple take him? It uh, it definitely helped Deuce Roberts that there was that connection uh, with Leo Wright, and then he had another coach that had ran had run into Chris Clark on the uh, at, at a tournament. So he had some people in his corner helping him out in that sense. But this and we've seen a couple highlight tapes of his huddle, whatever. Uh, but right now, there's not a whole lot we can say. I think I think it's fair to say he did really well against the competition that he played against. Um, in Missouri. He is, he has the physical stature. He's a really nice kid and he seems to be really, really infatuated with uh, both the idea of playing for Aaron McKee, who, as we all know, played 13 years in the NBA. He seems to be really infatuated with the city of Philadelphia and everything he saw on his visit made him really excited to play, to play a temple and to play in Philly. But based off of basketball wise, there's not a whole lot you can say right now of, how good he's going to be. I don't think any of us can say um, there's a great line. I, I only watched the first 20 minutes of hustle and I not get to finish it. So I'm not spoiling anything, but there's a great line in the beginning where they're sitting in a quote unquote war room. We'll call it uh, of talking about prospects and Adam Sandler is not super in on a guy. Another guy in the room uh, really likes this guy. And this other guy says, you know, he's good at X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. He can do this, that, and the other thing. And Adam Sandler says, yeah, well, because you saw that on a highlight tape, his mom made. So when you're watching his huddle, when you're watching clips of him on YouTube, like, yeah, you're seeing the best of him. Um, he looks super athletic. Uh, you know, he's had a couple of really awesome highlight dunks. He can pass the ball. He can kind of shoot the ball, whatever. He seems like a versatile guard. He talks about being able to play on and off the ball. But from a basketball standpoint right now, there's not a whole lot we can say. But I think he, he seems like a prototypical, really solid fit and could, be a, and could down the line be a developmental good get for Temple. Vaughn, let me ask you this again. Again, we'll, we'll hope to get at some point over the next few weeks, or whether it's Aaron McKee, uh, Jimmy Fennerty, or Chris Clark, someone from the staff on the on the podcast at some point, they can answer the question directly once Deuce is signed. Um, it, it seemed to me that again, when you're recruiting, obviously, it's I mean, it's the biggest no kidding statement of all time. You got to recruit talent. You got to recruit great players. But it seemed that you know the guys that were leaving were got like so many people were excited about Quincy Adam McCoya. You know, when they got him, people were excited about Jake Forrester when they got him out of the transfer portal, uh, when they got Ty Strickland. But guys like that, you know, there are only so many minutes to go around. And when guys see, OK, a lot of these minutes are spoken for right now with Caleb Battle coming back, you know, with, um, you know, with Damian Dunn, with with Tyser Miller, with Zach Hicks, with Jaleel White it's there aren't too many minutes as much as you want kids to come in and compete. There aren't too many minutes to go for Do you think Javon, do you think this was the staff's way of saying, let's, let's take a flyer on a kid who's going to have a year to develop. And then when, when battle's gone, cause he told, told Sam I'm out after this year, regardless, it's not out of question to think that, that if Damien Dunn has another good year, he could look to leave graduate or, Maybe somebody throws a ton of NIL money at him and he can go somewhere else. Do you think this is, do you think the staff is trying to look at a different way of building its roster and saying, Hey, we're not going to get, we're not going to get a kid out of the portal right now. I, well, I say that. And yet I, I still think I'm, I'm hearing that they're in pretty solid shape with Shane Dizoni, who was a, a four-star recruit, but in terms of piecing together the roster, do you think they're looking at this kid and saying, here's a guy that, that sees an opportunity and we can be patient with him. Yeah, no, um, it, you know, if, if Coach Vaughn were on the Temple staff, I, I'd tell you that uh, as a staff, we decided to take this guy as a, as, as a drafting stash, pretty much. You know, the rotation's pretty much set, 
in the backcourt. There's concerns, at least on my end, about, uh, you know, Roberts' level of competition in high school. And that's a big factor into, you know, guys who don't get scholarship offers, but they're accomplished. It, it shows who you're playing against. And, you know, no disrespect to, uh, you know, Big 12 territory or anything, but no one's checking for Hoopers out of Missouri. That's just the bottom line. Um, and and he, he paid the price for it with the no offers until now uh, at Temple. So it's going to be one year, get him used to playing guys, you know, at this level because they're at Temple. So they, they can obviously play at that level, uh, you know, be a practice player for a year, learn what it takes to compete with these guys, get your body in shape. Six, six, one eighty isn't half bad, but you can put another 10, 15 pounds of muscle on them, get them to that one ninety five, two hundred 200 range, uh, and, and yeah, just a developmental project. And there's no pressure on him because, I mean, you look at from his standpoint, he can say, hey, I'm not even supposed to be here. There's no pressure. Like, I'm already overperforming just by being here at Temple, considering what my situation was just two weeks ago. So with all of that, there's really low risk, high reward. If he doesn't pan out, hey, Deuce, you know, um, maybe go transfer a JUCO, tighten up your skills a little bit, and, and then hit the portal again. Or if he winds up good, hey, man, you know what? You made us look real smart yep. discovering you as a, dom a dominant in the rough and taking a chance on you, and, and it paid off for us. So, I mean, there's really nothing wrong with the pick. Fill out a scholarship spot, and uh, and you, you got options now for when uh, Dunn and, and Battle are gone. Because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm operating this whole season as of those two are gone. Who, who are going to take their spots? in 2023, 2024, because mm -hmm. 22, 23 is the last year for both of them. Mm -hmm. So um, Kyle, in the first clip, you heard him talking about, hey, how did how did Temple get involved with a, with a player out in Missouri? Um, in the second clip here, you're going to you're going to hear Kyle asking, you know, asking Deuce about, you know, being a sleeper because he, he tweeted about it and he tweeted out the literal definition of it and not getting, you know, acknowledging like, hey, you didn't get the recruiting tension that uh, that you thought you deserved. So here's Kyle uh, talking to Deuce Roberts about that. I, I saw on your Twitter, you had the, the literal dictionary definition of the word sleeper posted at one point. Is, is that kind of how you view yourself? Just a, a kid with a chip on his shoulder that maybe isn't getting the attention he deserves? Yeah, yeah. That's that, My dad said that to me one day. Um, I want to say in the, like, it was about last summer. And he told me that I had no idea what it meant. I thought it was... I thought it was negative at first, and I looked it up, and I I, I do agree that that's kind of how I'm going growing up. That's how it was, you know, just somebody who was just overlooked, and I think being in a given the right uh, situation, I can really shine. And Temple seems like it'd be a great fit for me. So, I mean, it, was there ever a moment, because, like, you're a guy who was a two-time All-State selection. Like, you have the size to play the next level. Was there ever a moment when you were like, what else do I need to do? Like, why aren't I getting the attention that, you know, kids with my accolades are usually getting? Yeah, um, you know, being a <clears throat> being a, a kid, you know, you kind of see everybody and all your friends uh, getting offers and signing and committing. It kind of makes you wonder like what else do I need to do because you're it's not like you're not you don't have it you know I had it and what it, all it was was I was just all I did really was just sit back and just let God really. at one point in time I just decided to like I'm around this time a month ago before right before they uh reached out to me I just you know said i'm gonna give it up to god and just let god handle it because you know all i can control is how much work i put in and just my faith and so that's just how i looked at it yeah i was i i got discouraged early on going into my senior year i was a little discouraged um but right around second semester of my senior year is when i just decided to really let god take control and then um, I had a lot of good people in my ear just telling me the right one's going to come, the right one's going to come. And sure enough, they were right. And so the, the final clip you're going to hear here is Kyle talking to Deuce about his play style and his fit. You know, what did Temple 
say to him during his official visit. Again, if, you, um, if you're an Al Scoop subscriber, you can hear the whole interview. You can hear Kyle's whole interview with Deuce Roberts. You can read the story. Um, maybe we'll get the chance to talk to, to Damian Dunn at some point over the next month or two because he played pickup with guys on the current, uh, current team. So maybe we'll, we'll ask them about what they saw in Deuce Roberts. But this is Kyle talking to Deuce about his play style, his fit, what Temple talked to him about how, in terms of how they see him uh, fitting into the program and how he described himself as a player. Just, I guess, circling back to just actually on the court. I mean, it looks like you played on the ball a lot in high school and the AAU level, but it looks like you also have the skill set to kind of go off the ball or play more of a wing position. Has Temple kind of talked to you about where they see you or where you see yourself playing at the next level? Uh, they, they, yeah, they talk to me and they just kind of see me as uh, like a combo guard, a guard who could do both, play on and off the ball. And so they just told me, come in, I'm ready to work, you know. So, yeah, they talked to me about that, and I'm, I mean, I'm ready to work. That's what, kind of what you said, on the ball and off the ball is kind of how they'll have me playing is what the coaching staff expressed to me. Now, imagine somebody, you know, had never seen you play. How, how would you describe yourself as a player? I think I have high energy, um, a high energy guy who can get up and down the floor. Um, and I play both sides, so I play offense and defense. But I'm I'm athletic and I can and I can shoot. So I just think I'm just a all around player. Um, and it just took the right the right person to see me. Um, but for someone who hasn't seen me, if I would just tell them what I think of myself as a player, I just say I can play both sides, uh, offense and defense, whatever you need me to do. All right, so. Hopefully, you know, again, once once he once he signs again, it would be like, I think, an aid agreement at this point. We'll, we'll um, hopefully be able to talk to Aaron McKee or, or Chris Clark or Jimmy Fannerty, Monte Ross, somebody from the staff. Uh, once they're allowed to talk about Deuce on the record to get their take on him. Um, mentioned Shane Dazzoni there. I, I the, the Vanderbilt transfer, who was a, a four star player, I think a top 100 player um, ranked by rivals. I continue to hear the temples in the mix for him. And so. You know, yeah, out of one side of my mouth, I'm saying, okay, maybe it makes sense to take a developmental guy. Now, Shane Dazoni still, if he comes in, may not play a ton of minutes, but I could see Shane Dazoni being that type of guy, a wing shooter. Again, it's a small sample size we're looking at. He showed that he could shoot the ball in his one season at Vanderbilt, did have quite a few turnovers. So that's something he would have to tighten up. But, you know, Dazoni, higher recruiting, pro, pro, much higher recruiting profile, but if they get a player like him who can shoot it, another guy who I think would, would have to be ready to step in as a secondary scoring option there. Uh, again, we'll, we'll bring his name up again uh, in the mailbag. We get asked about him in the mailbag, but thought I would bring him up now. Um, another piece of basketball recruiting news to pass along, Jadam Ross from the class of 2023, a 6'6 shooting guard, um, is on an official visit to Temple right now as we're recording this on Wednesday, late afternoon, around 4.40 p.m., um, so here, their biggest competition with him is UConn, Virginia Tech, Penn State. Talked to a couple of people about this. I don't get the indication that he's committing anytime soon. Plays at the St. James School. That is the alma mater of what former Temple player? Played before, played at Temple before you guys got to Temple. Javon, I'm, look at, Javon, I'm looking at you because it's a Baltimore area kid. Plays yeah, overseas yeah. now, plays overseas now, played at Temple. Six eight wing forward. Again, he played at Temple before before you guys enrolled. From Baltimore area. Yes. The St. James okay. School was out just outside of Baltimore, Javon, or like on the outskirts of Baltimore. Uh, uh, let's let's see let's see because now, as I've told you before, there's a lot of disputes between Baltimore territory and and DC territory. I think St. James School falls more into the. Uh, DC suburbs here, territory. No, Baltimore County. Okay. No, just never heard of it. Uh mm -hmm. I'm slacking. He was involved. He was involved in a play where Temple was playing against Iowa in the NCAA tournament. There was a somewhat famous no call. At one point he was being looked at as a potential draft pick, could shoot it, but his numbers went down a little bit. Obi and Echionia. Uh 
Oh, okay. Dante just shook his head. Football Dante was like, I don't know. I don't care. Nigerian American. Please. Kobe was very close to our time. He his last yes. year was our senior high school. Yeah. I was trying to think like yeah. before that. I wasn't didn't realize how close. Oh, very, but yeah. Very good college player. At one point was being mentioned as maybe potentially like a, a late first round pick, but he didn't didn't finish off his college career in emphatic fashion, but he's making some money playing overseas. So uh, but he also played at the St. James School, which is where Jaden Ross is playing right now. So um, just a name to keep an eye on in 2023 class. Again, we'll, we'll keep you updated on. Um, yeah, as of now, they're at 11 scholarships. I think if I, I think if Temple gets Shane Dazoni, I think they will definitely roll another scholarship over again. I think this is going to be interesting to watch over the next couple of years. How many kids do you take out of the portal? How many high school kids are you taking? We'll keep an eye on that. Uh, Transitioning over to football, I mentioned at the outset of the show that I talked to Stan Drayton on Tuesday about how Temple's first three prospect camps have gone so far. He told me that they had close to 400 players at their first Memorial Day camp, uh, camp during Memorial Day weekend. Bringing back that Memorial Day camp is important for them, kind of a big deal. It's something that I think was a real blind spot for Rod Carey. One of the first things that he did when he came in, he uh, and I've talked to multiple people about this, and he talked about camps. He said, we're not doing a Memorial Day camp. And there were a few coaches on the staff that said, I don't think that's a smart move. We need to get a head start on this. Rod had other ideas. So bringing that camp back is something that, you know, that they've wanted to do. Um, you can read a transcript of, of my conversation with Stan here, the majority of the interview, if you're, if you're an OwlScoop subscriber. Uh, we'll play a clip here for you guys. One of my takeaways from the interview was him talking about how, you know, he approaches things differently with, with this camp at Temple. So, you know, and this is kind of easy to think about when you, when you think about it, it, you know, places like Texas and Ohio state in the past for him, it was really a positional thing. The head coaches there are saying, you know, you, you, you're the running backs coach. You, I need you to make sure that you get some of the top backs in the country in this area to camp. And it's a lot of position evaluation, whereas a temple, you're projecting more. You're evaluating based on body types, size, athleticism, and looking at where they might be able to fit in. Um, I thought he had some good insight here, so we'll 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 play this clip for you. What you guys are doing now is it similar to what you've done in the past? A little different? Like, do you beg, borrow, and steal from things you've done in the past, or is it kind of unique to to Temple? Yeah, you know, uh, I think you know a lot of what we do is. It's pretty similar to what I've done in the past. You know, it's really only so much you can do because right. you're really just trying to evaluate yeah. positionally. But the one thing that I can say is probably pretty unique to where I've been, you know, is we're, we're doing a lot of projecting as mm-hmm. well, yeah. right? You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, here and uh, in our footprint for the type of kid that we're getting at, you know, at Temple is... You know, it could be a Hassan Reddick who plays quarterback right. in high school and comes into your camp as a running back. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you he, you find out he's a pass rusher. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, yeah. know, it's just, yeah. you, you know, and so what you do normally is you just let them play. You just let them play. You watch them compete. You know, you try to evaluate their characteristics. Are they a competitor or, or not? You know, uh, our coaches coach them, you know, just like they're coaching their current players on our team. So they can watch them respond to their style of coaching, you know, and that's how we find out if they can survive on our culture or not, you know, mm-hmm. and, and if, the, if the guy starts to check the boxes, you know, by the end of the camp, you know, I tend to, you know, single those guys out and have an individual meeting with them and their parents to kind of get a deeper feel for who they are as a person, what are their goals, you know, um, what are the intangibles, you know, and then we sit there and try to fit um, see if they're going to be a fit for Temple. Mm-hmm. You know, in most places that I've been, you know, guys are pretty specialized. We 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 know a lot of, you know, what they're capable of doing. You know, uh, they're probably a little bit more positionally established, you know. But uh, here we get an opportunity to project, mm-hmm. you know. So we, we kind of set the camp that way so we can get some projections. You know, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because, Two weeks ago, I visited the the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and yeah. we have a lot of we have a lot of Temple alum oh, yeah. coaching on that staff, and and uh, you know Todd Bowles brings up the point. He goes, "You know what's amazing is people don't realize that there are so many players in this league uh, playing all different positions that started off at quarterback." Oh yeah, 
Yeah. Right. And their DBs, now they're backpelling, they're linebackers, they're tight ends, you know, but they started off playing quarterback, you mm-hmm. know, and that makes sense, you know, um, mm-hmm. you know, who, who, who in high school won't put their best athlete at quarterback, right? Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's what they are. Yeah. Right. But, um, so we got to set that, you know, with that mindset in mind, we have to set our camp up that way. So that it does give us the ability to project, uh, where these kids can potentially be, you know, later on in the future. So what, what, what this tells me, and again, I think this is what some people like about what they're hearing so far. Again, Temple has yet to play a football game, understand Drayton, but I think Stan gets the blueprint of how things worked for Temple before. Camps were, in, were critically, critically important, excuse me. Um, Al Golden told me years ago, we cannot, we cannot ascribe to the herd mentality of recruiting. You can't just look around, look at a list and say, oh, we need to go after all the 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 four-star guys and the five-star guys, A, they're not going to get them. B, you're getting in on them way too late. You know, for Temple, it's about getting in on guys early, building the relationship. Or, you know, you heard that that clip there where Stan said, like, hey, we, you might – what high school coach oftentimes doesn't put his best player at quarterback? And sometimes you're looking at a quarterback and saying this kid may play quarterback in, in high school, but we want to see if he can backpedal. We want to see if he can be a linebacker or something like that. Um, but it's so far again, we've said this again, it's very early. He seems to be pressing a lot of the right buttons in terms of mixing what he wants to do with the program versus what worked before, um, with camps. Um, what did you guys think of that, of that clip? Does he sound like a guy that kind of gets how things have worked here in the past? I would say definitely. I think, uh, one of the reasons I was so high on him. Uh, as a coach during like the the hiring cycle, just because if you watch his interviews at Texas, he talks so much about developing players and how important that is to him. And and that's coming from a guy who was coaching at a school that could pull three, four or five stars every right. class. Um, so to hear him continually say that, despite the fact that they're pulling those types of players, I think was what really turned me on him as a potential candidate. Um, and it's nice to see him follow through with that. And that seems to be his mentality because he's right. I mean, you're not you know, you're not going to get in on the four and five star guys at Temple very often. It's just, it's not going to happen. They're going to get plucked. They're going to go to other schools. NIL is going to probably make that even worse given the other resources that other schools have, whether that's local or even not local coming up here to, to, to take some of those uh, better players. So yeah, I mean, you have to pull, you know, Brandon Collier, PPI guys that are two-star recruits, but have ridiculous measurables and athletics and turn them into Isaac Moore, who's a starting caliber tackle for four years, right? Like you have to do that type of stuff at Temple consistent, consistently. And I pulled a European example, but it basically is the same rule of thumb for the kid in South Jersey, who's a two-star recruit, but you know what? He's really fast and we're going to figure out whether or not he's a corner or wide receiver running back and where he can help us and, and different things like that. So um, I think that that's important. You have to be able to create a consistent program of development. If you're going to be a long-term success at temple. Uh, and, and that is something that, you know, maybe Rod Carey didn't quite do, although, you know, we're not really sure. Again, it takes a couple of years to see those guys come through the ranks, but um, based on early returns, probably he didn't do a good enough job of that. And he certainly didn't talk about it that much either. So <laughs> it's, it's good to see Stan Drayton put that emphasis back on the program, because that's the only way you're going to win for a long time here. Dante, let me ask you this, because you, you talk to some guys around the country with, with you know, evaluating draft projects, uh, prospects, excuse me. And, um, you know, you, you, you talk about the developmental piece of it. Do more of the bigger programs do more of this stuff than we think? Or is it kind of, do you, have you seen a kind of like a clear line of demarcation where it's like a lot of the power five schools, when they have camps, it's just positional stuff. We know who the receivers are. We know who the running backs are. We know who the quarterbacks are. It's a little bit more cut and dried in terms of what you're seeing. Or the, when you talk to some people around the country, are you seeing a little bit more of this where uh, they are focused a little bit more on the developmental piece for saying, Hey, this guy's six, six, two sixty. We don't know what he is just yet, but we're going to fit him in somewhere. Yeah. I think there's a little bit more of an emphasis on the positional stuff as you get higher into, you know, the better teams in college football, because, you know, a lot of those really, really good players are really, really good because they're good in the position that they play. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's kind of like, you know, when you get those guys who, 
Um, you know, you're not really sure where they play. They're typically not rated as highly. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule where you just have these, you know, five star athletes who play three positions that are just bonkers good across the board. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, a lot of those guys are so highly rated because they're easy projections for teams. And it's very obvious what they're good at and what they're bad at. Um, so I think a lot of those players tend to slip through the cracks a little bit. And you know what? You can end up with a three-star recruit at Temple who athletically and size-wise is comparable to any five-star that is going to go out there uh, and play for Ohio State or Texas. It's whether or not you can develop the rest of their game to get them to the point where they're you know, a comparable college football player. Now, obviously, that's way easier said than done. And one thing that I've learned over the years of talking to people who – um, you know, work in recruiting in other uh, parts of the country uh, as part of my draft process. I try to talk to some of these people, get to know these kids, right? Is like the big schools, they care way more about athletic testing than anything else. What did you run? How big are you? We're going to go from there. Uh, and that is really, really big. High school film, it's not like college, right? Like NFL teams will put you know, at least the good NFL teams put college film over athletic testing. It is the complete opposite. Uh, good going to high school. They care way more about your athletic testing than your film. You can have good film. If you're not a good athlete, you're going to be a two star and you're not going to get that many offers. It's just, it's just the way that it is. So um, I, I would say, you know, Stan is taking the right approach, but it is not the same approach the national programs are going to take probably. Mm -hmm. So as a reminder, Temple's fourth prospect camp is coming up this weekend. We'll have more official visitors, including uh, Jacques Smith from Jesuit High School in Tampa, uh, an offensive lineman, Cole Skinner from Point Pleasant Borough High School in New Jersey. I talked to him uh, earlier this week, and uh, we're going to play uh, a clip for you here from that interview. Um, it, it sounds, again, same thing. If you're an Scoop subscriber, you can, uh, you can read the story there, read the full story. It sounds like Temple's in – pretty good shape. I mean, he says, you know, a couple of times during the interview, and you'll hear in this clip that we're going to play for you about his relationship with Chris Wiesahan and about his relationship with Stan Drayton. He talks about how close the coaches and the players are. And that's why they're like, he says, they're so high uh, on the list. Um, but, you know, wherever he ends up, you know, he's, he's coming to Temple for an official visit this weekend. Right after that, he's going to uh, camp at Penn State. Some, some other big schools are starting to show interest now. He camped at Maryland and NC State last weekend uh but he's got an interesting backstory you know he this was his first this past season was his first full year in football he had a back injury as a sophomore a stress fracture in his back he almost quit playing and um this is a really cool kid enjoyed my time talking to him you know wherever he ends up i think whatever program he ends up at uh just by talking to him it sounds like they're gonna get a really really solid kid but this clip that you're gonna hear is of cole skinner talking about stan drayton and why he likes stan he was a very humble guy, um, very outgoing. Mm -hmm. he, he loves the sport of football. Mm -hmm. and that, I, um, when I first went down to junior day, he was saying that he was raising men, not football players. That's what really, um, that's what I really loved about Temple because they actually cared about you. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was like my first thing with Coach Drayton. Mm -hmm. And I, when I went in him, like when I went in to talk with him in his office, he was just a very outgoing guy, uh, cared a lot. He was just a great guy to talk with. All right, so we'll keep an eye on on his recruitment. Uh, we'll also be talking to Peter Clark, who's uh, an NFL Academy guy in London. Uh, we're scheduled to talk to him tomorrow. He just picked up. Uh, he just picked up a Temple offer. Uh, There's some other schools involved in his recruitment uh, as well. UTSA, who's going to be joining the American, uh, Arkansas State, Nevada, Tulane, Eastern Michigan, Robert Morris, Kansas, Northwestern State, and North Texas have also offered him. So um, another player to keep an eye on there. And again, we'll continue to keep you plugged in on uh, the latest recruiting news. Um, we'll get to the mailbag here. So the, the first mailbag question we have here, the screen name, this is from our Al Scoop message board. We just usually call this person Al to the eighth degree. Uh, can we put together a suggested depth chart for football at this point after spring practice, like at least a Jeff Collins style above the line, below the line. We basically have two deep quarterback spot, maybe a three deep running back spot. Um, talking about Darvon Hubbard, Ed Sadie, Iverson Clement. There's been so much change to this team. I don't even know where to start. So Sam and Dante, you guys, this was back in, you know, during the spring game, you guys were tweeting out, you guys cobbled together 
um, uh, some, you know, your own depth charts on both sides of the ball. He's saying we basically have a two deep quarterback spot. I would argue, you know, we're just talking about this Quincy Patterson. They officially, officially signed him. So it's, you know, Quincy Patterson, we can talk about this more in a second, um, Dewan Mathis and Mariano Valente there. And I think everybody else, unless EJ Warner comes in and lights the world of fire in, in August, but, um, what are, you know, we talked about this a couple months ago, if we were to look at these unofficial depth charts, and again, a lot will change or could change in August with preseason camp, Sam, you would put together the offense and Dante, you put together the defense, right? Correct. Sam, you would read up some of the highlights of your offensive depth chart. I guess yeah. Quincy Patterson was not in the, in the mix uh, around that time for, for a quarterback. Yeah. So all of this was uh, from pro day. So I would highly not pro day. I, Train every time team. I bring up, Every single time I bring up either pro you want to or blend the two. Game, I say the other one. I say yes. the other one. Yes. From cherry white game. So uh, I would highly suggest going back in, if you're more interested in this, reading what Dante and I had written uh, from that day. But um, what I have for the offense is uh, Dewan Mathis. And then obviously Quincy Patterson's the other name you mentioned. Like he was, he did not participate because he's not with the team then. Uh, at running back, Iverson Clement, we believe, has moved to defensive back based on his Twitter bio if I'm not mistaken. So mm-hmm. all I have written down is Ed Sadie and Darvon Hubbard. Dante, I don't know if we had a third. I just, if we do, I don't have it written down. At wide receiver, Jose Barbone, Devon Fox, Ahmad Anderson. At tight end, David Martin Robinson, and then James Del Pesca. And the offensive line from left to right is Victor Stoffel, Richard Rodriguez, Wisdom Corshi, Bryce Toman, and Adam Klein. That would put uh, Wiz at center, which is a big question that we had. Um, during spring ball, uh, just kind of who would fill CJ Prez's spot. Um, so that's what I have right now for the offense. I would say Jordan Smith at tight end. Yeah, I'm Jordan Smith Jordan. plays receiver, doesn't he? He's kind of they've been. I mean, the well, the previous like floater at this point. At, like, yeah, I guess I don't have him written down. That's end. a good point. Uh, I think I've, Adam Shire said he's he's in that room with the tight ends, if yeah. I remember correctly. Uh, Out there, yes, Jordan so. Smith in there. It's the Mickey Mouse notes app. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> notes app depth chart would, anyway. Uh, That's why I suggest you go read what we wrote two months I ago. Mean, I would also throw in again, now he wasn't in the mix at the time, I don't think, but based off of what we're hearing about the the arc that his career started to take at Georgia Tech, maybe Adonica Sanders is a guy that you that you throw in there in the mix. And and wide receiver, receiver, yeah. yeah. I mean, things are wide open there. With Iverson Clement, I wish him well. I got a yeah, we'll see. I mean, he has to really kind of get his stuff together and stick with the program, whether it's at running back or defensive back. If he if he's moving over to the DB room, I'd say maybe you slide someone like Trey Blair in, into the mix there uh, at running back. But, um, yeah, that's why it's going to be an interesting preseason camp to cover. A lot of, you know, a new staff, a lot of positions up for grabs virtually – Every position up for grab. Javon, any names here that you think that the that we left out that you think of or no? Smith was the first one that came to mind and pretty much the the only one after what mm-hmm. we saw at the spring game. Uh, mm-hmm. I think I think the defensive line is the group I'm the most excited about this season, though. To see what those young guys look like. Um, we, we already know Sylvester Mathis is probably my favorite edge rusher in the conference uh, after his spring <laughs> game performance. Just my overreaction piece for the season. Um <laughs> <laughs> he did. But I mean, he had a good, he had a good game, but yeah. we'll see. There have been a lot of guys that, that have had great spring games statistically in the past that, that uh, I'm not saying he's going to be, that's going to be his, his, uh, that's going to be his, his lot in life with that. But um, that's a good segue into the defense. Dante, what did you have on, on, uh, what did you have on, uh, what did you have on the defensive side of the ball? Yeah, so for uh, D end, I have Darian Varner and Jaquavia on the home. Uh, and then at the nose tackle spot, I have a split between Zach Gill and Jalen Satchel. Uh, outside linebacker, we saw a little bit of Leighton Jordan and McKean McCargo at those spots. And then also Javon's man, Sylvester Mathis, uh, was in there quite a bit. Inside linebacker was about as consistent as it gets. Kobe Wilson and Jordan McGee were the first linebackers off the bench pretty much the entire day. Uh, at corner, Cameron Ruiz did not play. He was injured, but we still expect him to be the starter, uh, followed by Keyshawn Paul. Uh, filling in for Ruiz of note, Jalen McMurray, Dominic Hill, and Nate Wyatt all got a chance to play on the first team. Uh, and then Jalen Ware and Deshaun Winston were the two safeties. Really no rotation there. Okay, good stuff. Uh, again, 
we'll see how that develops. We'll see. Hopefully, we'll get some. We'll we'll get some players to talk to in in uh, preseason camp. I talked to again. If you um, uh, if you read the transcript of my interview with Stan Drayton, I asked him about that about how methodical he's been, and he said I appreciate you guys as reporters being more patient with that stuff. I imagine we'll have players to talk to in August, but again, a lot of spots. Up for grabs, uh, the next question here, the screen name is B Devin for any updates on Shane Dezoni from Vanderbilt. So as I said a few minutes ago, um, continue to hear that they're very much in the mix there. Uh, there are a couple other things that need to be firmed up. Uh, it's interesting, you know, again, he was a four-star recruit, a top 100 player, had verbally committed to Arizona, backed out when Sean Miller was fired, ends up at Vanderbilt, has proven he can shoot the ball. Um you know, flashed a little bit as a true freshman, um, enters the portal, ends up at St. Joe's, and then announces that he's getting back into the portal. And uh, I don't know. We'll see. Nothing's, you know, done until it's until it's done. But I think Temple's got a pretty good shot here from, from people I trust. So we'll see what happens. And there, there would be another guy, as I mentioned earlier, who can shoot it, a good wing guard, that if he comes in and things work out for him, you know, you, you play this year, you groom yourself, and then you have a chance to step into a bigger role when guys like Hale Faddle and Damian Dunn move along. We'll see what happens. The other part, the other part of um, B. Devin Force question here, and it's a little bit longer, with the lack of any experienced ball handlers outside of kind of Fabe, and Fabe is the nickname of, of um, Heiser Miller, do you see the Owls utilizing a more intense full court press this season in an effort to shorten the court and utilize the collective length and depth on the wings, McKee has said for years that he wants to get out and run, but we've still never really seen it. Even the secondary breakouts never really materialized. Finding easy buckets without any point guard depth could be an issue. This is something we've talked about in part, that the point guard depth, I'll, I'll throw this over to Sam and then Javon too. I want to hear what you guys have to say about this. We talked about the point guard depth, and if they don't bring in another you know, tried and true ball handler, that that, that other guy that's going to handle the ball predominantly beyond – Hi, Sierra Miller would be Jolly Old White, who still has some work to do there, but he can do it. Um, but let's get to that question. Do you see the Owls utilizing a more intense full court press this season in an effort to shorten the court and utilize the collective length and depth on the wings? What do you guys think? I would be shocked and I would be appalled if they did not. Uh, it's something that they've done every wow. single year. <laughs> it's something that they've done every year since Aaron came in. It's, it's, uh, it's intensity at both ends of the floor. It's pushing the pace at both ends of the floor. And I think, the interesting thing is, um, you know, to the question, uh, we've seen a lot of um, we've seen them have a lot of success in pressing because of someone like Jeremiah Williams, who's long and wiry. I think we talked about on the podcast on the Kyle Gauss birthday version of this podcast. <laughs> I mentioned how successful he was in breaking the press, but he was also a big part in uh, in pressing other teams just because he can play up in like a one two two zone press or if they do a man press and trap uh, in the corner by half court, whatever. He can be that guy. They've also put Nick Jordan in that situation. They've also put guys like Quincy Adam McCoy in that situation. They, you know, they can put guys like Damien Dunn in that situation. So, uh, yeah, they're looking for long athletic guys. You can kind of put any of them up on uh, in in pressing. So I, I wouldn't say just because Fabe is six foot in shoes um, that they're not going to press as much. I, I still think they're going to they're absolutely going to press a ton. Uh, they're absolutely going to force the issue defensively. But I think it brings up the interesting question, which is something that John, you had had a chance to talk to Aaron for a few minutes about. And it's something that, you know, I've asked him before is he said since day one, like, I want to get out and push the ball. I want all my guys, everybody on the floor to be, to be comfortable putting the ball on the floor. I want to push the pace. And he has said it a ton, but I, he said, I asked him at the end of the season, he had said something like, you know, we didn't really have the pieces to do it. And then John, I thought he said something really interesting to you which we played on this pod a while ago. Um, he said something like, man, I just say that. Like it he is talking what he, more, he was talking more about playing inside out. And he talked about not having like the post, not even depth, just the talent. We've, we've talked about this at length. They, they didn't have anybody that they could throw the ball into. Yeah. In, and I think, they and, go, um, I, I think they go hand in hand just to be able to play the style right. that he wants. I think mm -hmm. just speaking more broadly to play the style that he yeah. wants. He says, like, this is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. And it's true. It's what he wants. But he hasn't necessarily had the pieces to really thrive with that style of play. Again, mm -hmm. to play inside out, to be able to push the pace because he hasn't had five guys on the floor. They all are comfortable passing, dribbling, shooting, whatever. Um, so, 
to the point, but anyway, I'm, I'm getting off topic. Uh, to the point of the question, yes, I think um, just because Fave is likely uh, an undersized day one starting point guard, I still think he, he's he's a tough defender. Uh, I still think they can they could definitely press press other teams and and they'll be more strategic about where they put people and what kind of zone presses they run. Yeah, and on top of on top of those backcourt presses that they run, like in, in the half court, once they get across the, the, the line, they play a lot of hedge and recover defense. And and, and Sam, you know, you're, you're a former hooper yourself on the wrong side of six feet. You know how easy it is to annoy guys that are six feet and under when you've got that small size that guys like High Samuel have. Those are the worst guys that you want guarding you. So it's really not even a defensive liability. Uh especially with the big men like Kyrgyz Kitchen and, and Jamil Reynolds that Temple has brought in. If he gets beat going to the rim, which I did not see happen a lot last season for High State Miller, he's got protection back there now. So uh, defensively, he won't be a problem. They, they'll, they'll love running their press this season again. I will say, though, and, and it's an idea that I got John to come around on just a little bit towards the <laughs> end of last season. Damian Dunn as a sixth man. I know nope. Sam and Kyle were not nope. happy about it last season because it's nope. Temple and it's not the NBA. Nope. However, not even just starting the game on the bench. I'm saying go ahead, start that game with the three-guard rotation of, of Miller, Dunn, and Battle. But first man off the bench should be either White or Hicks, and that should be for Dunn's spot. If, that's, that's my point. If Damian Dunn were to be the sixth man, he would have he jumped ship. He'd be gone. Oh, yeah, he transferred. That's what I'm saying. You can't start him off on the bench. No, but he does. I would say to benefit him, the way he likes to score and how easy it is for him at times to score, if he could be the first guy out of the starting rotation for Zach Hicks. So you want you want him on the second line. You want him to bolster your second line because you have a scorer like Caleb Battle and you want to split those two up because the question has always been how do they fit together and you want to just – not split them up to different teams, but split them up into different rotations so one of them can be ball dominant, control the yeah. pace floor while the other's on the bench. Yeah, I think Dunn could get an easy, efficient 15 a game if he plays more with the second unit than the starting unit. He has to start and he has to be a part of that closing lineup. There's only there's 40 minutes a game and neither of them are playing only 20. Yeah, no, no, no. You're definitely right about that. I'm yeah. just saying a little, just a little bit of time with the second unit for he for him to score easily. And you know, well, yeah, it's, well, no, I, 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 I will say this like, because you have, and this is something I talked with Caleb a little bit about, uh, about how they fit together, but because uh, he kind of alluded to the fact that last year they spent a lot of time in practice on different teams, on different teams, and he doesn't want that this year, yeah, and he wants to spend more time on the same team in practice this year. I think the vantage point of having two scores like that is that you can at all times have one of them on the floor, yeah. So to your point about bolstering the second line, yeah, I think that it helps. And, you know, if you want it to be Dame, sure. If you want it to be Caleb, that's fine too. Like, I, But they're both going to start the game. They're both going to play 30-plus minutes. But the vantage point of having two, uh, in Temple terms, elite scorers, um, in American Athletic Conference terms, elite scorers, uh, that you can feasibly play at least one of them, you know, have one of them in the entire game. Yeah, that, that solves the ball handling issue that was asked about. And we have to remember, Jaleel White, he's a full-on point forward these days. At, at least that's what he showed in that back half of last season. So he helps alleviate that issue too. So I don't think ball handling really is as big of a problem as it may look on the surface. Like if you go back and look at everything post-January 15th, I guess we'll use as a benchmark. Ball handling, I don't think it's going to be a problem. I was going to say, like, this isn't part of the mailbag question, but um, and people talked about this, about him coming out of Wildwood Catholic. Again, it was one season. He didn't play his true freshman year because he was recovering from the meniscus tear. But what did you guys see? Not that he had the ball in his hand a ton. It was kind of all over the place. But what did you think of Julio White as a ball handler when he had the ball in his hands? Was he strong enough? Again, it's a small sample size. So what did what'd you think? He, he's a guy who's going to get it to where it needs to go. He's not going to do too much with the ball. He's not going to turn it over. Um, like, I'm not saying he was the floor general that Jeremiah Williams was, but the ball got where it needed to go. There, there weren't many wasted possessions when he was the guy running the show at the top of the key. And, and he, he goes and guards the best guy on the team on the other end and does not get tired. And that does not factor into him playing sloppy on the other end. Uh, 
I think in the pick and roll, he was very efficient at getting to the rim. And I do believe if they had a big man that the guards trusted, uh, he'd be able to be one of those guys who can read that dump off pass. I think from the select few practices that we saw, uh, you know, that we were able to go to last season on top of what we saw in game, I'll just speak from my own personal experience and what I've seen from the point guards I've played with and seen up front. I don't think they trusted the big men on last year's team. I think Okpomo started gaining that trust a little bit once he started playing more minutes and got himself in shape a little more. But I don't think any of the other big guys, well, I'm saying that as if it were a lot besides Rashma Parks and, and uh, Jake Forrester, but I don't think they had the trust of the guards nah. last season. I think this year they're hoping for a different story. I'll say that. Yeah, Aaron had said – oh, go ahead, Sam. Uh, I think Jaleel White is – showed like he can be – he's comfortable with the ball in his hands at times. Uh, he turned the ball over 57 times last year. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, he is second to only Damian Dunn, uh, who turned the ball over 76 times last year. Mm -hmm. And after that, what's the per game like, numbers on those, Sam? Uh, 27 games in 76 turnovers. You do the math for Dame. Ja is 29 games played with 57 turnovers. Um, that's about so close to two. I mean, for guys with the ball in their hands that much, I don't think that's that bad. Yeah, 1.96 for a job, just a shade under two turnovers a game. So, okay. Not so terrible. Yeah, no, it's not life altering. But uh, my point is that, like, the difference, and obviously it's different because Dame and Ja have the ball in their hands a lot uh, compared to other guys, but it's like those two it's Dame, drop off, Ja, 10 turnover, drop off, 12 mm -hmm. turnover, drop off to the next guy. Um, and I only say it to, to say that, like, he's not there yet. Uh, I don't say it to say he's, he shouldn't have the ball in his hands. I just say it to say that he's not there yet. Um, John, I mentioned it wasn't a huge sample size to draw from as a point guard, but I think that he's comfortable with the ball in his hands. Uh, I think that he has room to improve. And I think that he's going to be someone I look to, especially in two years uh, to have the ball in his hands even more than he will this year. Um, mm. Just worth noting. Next question or questions, I should say, comes from the screening, the Hick, who is, Going to single-handedly increase our average of mailbag questions per week with this one. There are one, two, three, four, five questions here. So we'll, we'll get to the <laughs> best we can. Uh, okay. Are we going to open up, this is for basketball, are, are we, meaning Temple, are we going to open up recruiting on a national scope? I'm going to go through these and then we'll tack them. Are we going to open up recruiting on a national scope? Are we going to focus more on retrofitting portal players or commit to recruiting and training high schoolers in quote, the temple way is the program working with the administration and specifically hired and trained NIL experts to make temple a welcoming destination to ambitious student athletes. Are we focusing on improving size and versatility? Are we getting support from the administration to rebuild and restore the temple men's basketball mission to reach lofty status? What is the meaning of life? He doesn't say what is the meaning of life, but. That probably would have been the next question. So for the first one, are we going to open up recruiting on a national scope? Temple already has. You know, they, they got Jeremiah Williams out of Simeon High School in Chicago. Was he a, an under-the-radar guy? Yes, but they got him. Uh, they got Damian Don out of Georgia, who's originally from Kinston, North Carolina. Uh, they got Quincy Adam McCoya, who has obviously since transferred. Um, you know, they, they just took a kid from Missouri. You know, so they, they are I Strickland's from Florida. I Strickland, yeah. I, there's we've talked about this before. There's always this push pull with I'm not gonna name names, but there are some AU coaches in Philly who are some, there are a lot of great ones, but there are some who are very self-serving and talk out of both sides of their mouth and say Oh, that's the whole country. Yeah, you gotta get you gotta get Philly kids, you gotta get Philly kids, you gotta get Philly kids. But what some of them really want is for Temple LaSalle, Villanova, Penn. St. Joe's Drexel to be the first to offer these kids and then they get a national profile and then these guys get some, you know, fringe benefits in the future for, for sending a kid somewhere else. And, you know, yes, they should get that. They, they, again, Aaron McKee's entering a critical fourth year, his contract, they should, and they need to win games this year. They need to get to the NCAA tournament. If they don't get to the NCAA tournament this coming season, it's a disappointment. It's an absolute disappointment if they if they don't get there, regardless of COVID, regardless of 
you know, the, the advent of the portal and NIL and stuff like that, they need to get to the tournament this year. And I, I think that's very fair. So I think they're more focused on, yes, trying to get Philly kids, but they're not opposed to, to opening up recruiting on a national scope. Like I said, they, they already have, they're not going to get five-star kids on a national scope because those kids are going to get, it's just going to be more out in the open. Now they're going to get a million dollars or, or half a million dollars. Um, are we going to focus more on retrofitting portal players or committing to recruiting and training high scores in the temple way? Again, I think these are easily answered questions. They're doing a little bit of both and one's going to affect the other. They're already trying to retrofit some players. I mean, if you, if they end up getting a Shane Dizoni, he can shoot the ball pretty well and he could be a, a piece for you to help spell Caleb battle and Damian Dunn in the future. So they're going to be doing a little bit of both. Um, any agreements or disagreements with that? Am I speaking out of turn there? Um, now you're on the right track. Keep going. It's, it's a program working <laughs> with the administration and specifically hired and trained NIL experts to make Temple a welcoming destination to ambitious student athletes. I mean, they've, you know, again, we've, we've talked about the fact that they did not have any grand announcements when NIL first became a thing. I think they were playing catch up there. I don't think that's any secret. Uh, they did. Uh, they have the arrangement now with NBC. It's Temple and Vanderbilt and one other school, right? I mean, NIL can take on a lot of different forms. Notre Dame. Notre Dame, thank you. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot there. I mean, there's still, there's a lot there with NIL. I think there's, there's more that could be done. They got um, the classes to teach the athletes about it. Uh, yes. Sam, I would, Sam, which, yeah, Tilo Kunkel, who's a, a member of the STHM, Sport Tourism and Hospitality Management faculty, teaches a class about it. Sam did a, a pretty comprehensive piece about Temple and NIL uh, for the Inquirer that you could check out. Um, we focus on focusing on proving size and versatility. Yeah. I mean, what, what program isn't, you know, we just talked, I mean, no, we just talked focus, about actually, I think that? Temple's focusing on getting, they're focusing on getting smaller and more one dimensional. I think. Yes. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we just talked about, we just talked about a player in Jolly Old White who, if you can get a six foot seven, six foot eight point forward, who can develop more as a shooter, bring the ball up the floor, can guard one through four, like all the classic stuff we say about, you know, these two-way players, of course, they're improving. They want to improve size and versatility. I think Aaron McKee and Chris Clark and the whole staff have been saying that uh, since they took over. I don't know. I, for one, would only recruit bad basketball players, yeah. personally. That, that is, only, that is the um, only type of basketball player I would. Yeah. And think that, about, John, on the note of uh, versatility, like think about how much um, Ja improved as a shooter from the start of the, from, you know, oh, yeah. the, start of the year to the end of the year, yes. even just a little bit. So assuming he gets better – if they can do something similar with Taj Thweet that they've done with Ja, if he can be anywhere kind of close to, I mean, I haven't seen a ton of Taj, but like similar six, seven body, uh, mm -hmm. if they can improve him, whatever, then yeah, they're, it's, it's all about size and versatility yeah. with, with Eric. Yeah, McKee. absolutely. Um, are we getting the support from administration rebuild and restore the Temple men's basketball mission to reach lofty status? Look, I'm not, I, I've yet to meet, Jason Wingard. I have met Arthur Johnson, but I think it's fairly safe to say that, look, that these guys do want to win. You know, I think they very much care about developing the entire student athlete and the entire student. And I don't think that's just a buzz phrase. I think they really truly do care about that, but yeah, they, they, they care about winning. They've made decisions already at other sports. You know, they, they parted ways with Tanya Cardo's 14 years time. Uh, you know, they part of ways with, with fake the volleyball coach. I don't, I'm not saying that hey, by any way, any way, shape or form, I'm hearing that like Aaron's on the hot seat, that they're going to fire him after this year. I'm not saying that, but yeah. I would say he's the next one under the microscope. Potentially. Yeah. Again, if they take a step backwards this year, unless, unless you are just snake bitten by injuries, you know, they should win 20 plus games and it's, it's time to get to the tournament. So um, are they getting the support from the administration? I mean, they've invested, they've invested money in the, you know, they've invested money in the facility. They revamped the weight room. They've added some resources there. Um, so are they getting support? Yes. Are they getting, you know, are they, you know, do they have all the bells and whistles of like a Duke, Kansas or Kentucky? No, but they've got a nice arena. They, they, they have a nice, facility but i do think i do think this is an administration that does care about sports and wants to win 
Aaron just has to make it to the 2024 class. There's and why is that again? Cycle. And then he can bring in both hope. I mean, if you're Temple, you're hoping you get both Jaron McKee and Sharif Jackson. Who you uh, who you've seen sons. recently, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. We're let, let's talk about this because John, you mentioned this is something you want to talk about in the pod. Um, so I I saw Jaron play twice during the season, and, um, and then I saw and I've seen Sharif play a couple times too, and then I saw them both play in the uh, All City All Star Game of the night, which it's an all-star game. So it's not like these guys are putting in everything. It's not like they're competing for scholarships in this game. Uh, but you know, it's still good to, to watch a lot of these guys. Uh, I think I, and I really hate to say this, I might be Jeremy McKee's bad luck charm. Um, in the two games that I went to in the two SJP games that I went to, I was told those were his worst two shooting performances or the only two games where he didn't shoot the ball that great. And the other night I, uh, I, sat down, he hit his first two shots, and then he kind of went cold. But what I've heard is that Jaron over the last few weeks in the AAU circuit has been the type of player that has gotten to the point where like he just can't miss. And he's gotten to the, he's gotten to the point where evaluators look at him, he puts up a shot, and it's like, that's probably going in. And it's not because he's just like Steph Curry. It's because he's very methodical and intentional with his shots. Aaron always talks about teaching him how to play the right way, teaching his guys how to play the right way. Uh, he doesn't really force anything. So he's a really smart player. He's only, a, he just finished his freshman year. It's going to be a sophomore at St. Joe's prep, but he's a, you know, the word on the street is that he's improved a ton. Uh, and I've seen Sharif Jackson out of Roman Catholic, obviously son of Mark Jackson um, play a handful of times. Every time I see him play, I'm astounded by the complex, not the complexity is the right word. Um, just for his age, how, how good he, how, I can't think of the word, how good he is for his age, I guess, for lack of a better word, whatever. Um, how advanced his post moves are, how strong his footwork is, how calm he is in the post. You know, he's, for a freshman, he was playing in the PCL championship, playing really, really well against a really good Newman Garetti team. Um, with, with Roman, he's played next to Dan Skillings, a, a name that Temple fans know pretty well because Temple was in on him. Uh, but those two, if you look at the way they played, Jaron was, you know, a top 15, probably top 15 scorer in the PCL. And Sharif Jackson was one of the best freshman forwards in the PCL this past year. Both of them, by the time they're seniors, uh, I think are thinking they're both going to be very, very good basketball players. So if Aaron can hang on to his job until then, then I think he'll be set. I think if, um, if, and I, I hate to compare, I mean, it's natural because every kid is you know their own person, but I mean, if Sharif, if he's being coached by his father, and Mark's one of my favorite people in the world, not just, I mean, he's doing, you know, I enjoy him as a Sixers analyst now, but yeah, I covered his career. We were in college around the same time and um, just everything he's overcome in his life. I mean, his mother was, was struggling, struggling, struggling to, to keep the water on, keep the electricity on. And, and he was a guy who got overlooked in the city because so many, like John Chaney almost got Rashid Wallace, almost got him. Rashid ends up at, uh, at North Carolina and Mark ends up at VCU and put up what two, three points a game there, but he transferred back home. And this is before social media and people were saying like, Hey, if you can sneak into McGonagall, get a look at this guy, he is tearing it up. He's really, really good. And he's one of the best college basketball players I ever saw with my own eyes between him, you know, Marcus can be some other guys. Mark was terrific. And he really worked tirelessly on his game. He got himself into better shape. Uh, he used to work out with the late John Hardnett and John used to have even big men play one-on-one -on -one full court, not just half court, one-on-one -on -one full court to work on their conditioning. And Mark used to do that. He used to work. He used to watch a ton of tape of like Carl Malone and really just, worked his butt off to be good and i would have to imagine he's working with sharif in the same way and if, if sharif is anything like his dad he's gonna have a he's, he's around a funny charismatic guy who works really hard and is gonna be a good teammates so yeah it could be a developing great story there you know for uh, two legacy guys that could come in and again I'd be, uh, oh, I, I shouldn't say it. I shouldn't jinx it because temple has had a couple of uh legacy players or at least one that they thought was coming and and Jalen Brunson, and boy, did that get interesting. Um, but um, yeah, a couple of really good players to, to, to keep an eye on there. Um, 
couple of questions to, to finish things out here, more in the, the fun, off-topic, slightly off-topic category. Our friend Ray Dunn, who got not one but two shout-outs today from 97.5 The Fanatic because of a, a, a Phillies tweet. Uh, John Kincaid shouted him out, and then Tyrone Johnson shouted him out. So Ray Dunn on Twitter, which Al Scoop, which Al Scoop staff member would most likely get cast in an Adam Sandler movie? This is, again, because of Hustle coming out. Uh, it's based in Philly. They shot a lot of it around LaSalle. Uh, he referenced, there's a Temple reference in there. Aaron McKee makes a cameo. Which Al Scoop staff member would most likely get cast in an Adam Sandler movie? I want to go last because I can see, it's going to sound like such a cop-out answer. I could see each one of you in it in different ways. Anybody have any strong opinions here? I think it, uh, it strongly depends on the plot of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so like if we're looking at hustle, I feel like we could throw Javon and just like Javon could find his way into hustle. Mm-hmm. Um, as like in, in the early scenes, again, I only saw the first 20 minutes, but he's at, uh, it's kind of a, I don't want to call it a montage. It's a little bit more time than, you know, a second, but it's like, 20 seconds of like in different gyms in different countries and some crazy shits going down in each of these gyms. I could see Javon being like one of the scouts he's talking to in one of those gyms in some like your, some like random European league. Uh, so that's where I'd put Javon Dante. I could see just being like in grownups. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why? Why am I in grownups, Sam? He sounds so disappointed. It's a terrible movie. It was just what? the first Adam Sandler movie. I, okay, up, just here to wait. Javon appears to be offended that Dante called Grown Ups a terrible movie. Wow, Dante, I think you'd be like, I think you'd have fun playing the role of like one of the the high school smart asses in Grown Ups. I well, really do. Look, 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 look. I'm not. I am not denying that acting in Grown Ups would be phenomenal, right? Because like that movie is just like a bunch of dudes hanging out, having a good time. Wait, I'm saying no. I, I changed my mind. I'm putting Kyle in. I'm putting Kyle in Grown Ups. <laughs> I'm putting. I'm putting Kyle in Grown Ups. <laughs> Kyle, I could see being one of the guys in Grown Ups. Or what if uh, Kyle sorry, rewind and Kyle is a, a very young Kyle Gauss is the little kid in Big Daddy. I don't know if I've seen that. Oh, uh, you got to watch. Big I've Daddy. only seen parts of it. Okay, so um, wow, number one. Uh, <laughs> also, counterpoint. I think Kyle could be a part of the rival team on the first Grown Ups, like the, like the team that Lenny and all of them had beef with when they were kids. I could see Kyle on that team. Hmm. I could also see Sam in about three or four years as like Sandler's millennial son who like just I I don't know how to explain it but it'd be one funny movie someone told me once a long time ago that they thought I looked like Adam Sandler I don't really see it I don't know if I see it you you make fun of his baggy shorts that he wears when he he goes plays basketball I don't wear baggy shorts like that when I hoop you know what I'm saying? You can make fun of the baggy shorts that he wears. That's what I'm saying. You're his oh, millennial yeah, son. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh. you're, you're catching yeah, him up yeah, yeah. on everything. Uh, I got you. I got yeah. you. If I could mine... get cast in it. A... Oh, go ahead, Dante. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say mine would be if there was like a football version of Hustle that Adam Sandler did. Like in the background of every scene is Caden talking to a recruit. He's not actually in, <laughs> he's not actually in the movie. He has no speaking lines. It's just... It's like, where's Waldo? But it's like, where's Keaton? And he's got like his notepad and a phone just like interviewing a random high school kid. You know, like he, he's not in the movie. You know, he's he's only credited as like interviewer in the credits, but it's, it's just Caden in the background of every scene. That that was going to be mine. If I could get, if I could be an extra in a sequel to The Wedding Singer, I'd be, I would die happy, man. Wedding Singer, another, another good Adam Sandler movie. I'm going to guess that you guys haven't seen it. No. Yeah, I think seen, that's uh, like one of the, the very one, few. What's that, guys? What's the one where he? What's the one where Adam Sandler plays a dad and his son is he's like an estranged father and his son is getting married or something like that? Uh, oh God, I should know this. Is a wedding or something? Um. Oh, I should know, and I don't know that the name of the movie is. It is. Me. Um. No, not the week of. Adam Sandler fans are upset with us right now. What is the name of this movie? I, all I'm seeing is The Wedding Singer. It's not The Wedding Singer. 
No, Wedding Singer is him, Drew Barrymore. Very, very funny movie. Is it the week of? Maybe it is. That's my boy. I'm thinking of that's my boy. Oh, okay. Uh, With uh, Adam Samberg. Uh, oh, um, yeah. And- yeah, 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 Andy yeah. Samberg. Samberg. Andy Samberg. Oh, uh, okay. I could also see John as like one of the friends trying to tell him how crazy he is. And I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry. I feel like John would be one of the friends trying to talk them out of, you know, whatever scam they're trying to pull. <laughs> could any of us, could any of us be an uncut gems? Could I be an uncut gems? You I could be. I would play, but well, just like someone in the deep end, someone in the Jewish family. If I'm just someone in the Jewish family that really likes basketball, watching the Celtics, I feel like I could fit in an uncut gem somehow. Tom Agnuto, who you finally met, is a huge, huge, Tom and I uh, met like in person for the first huge time. uncut gems guy. Tom is not. He's Italian. He's not. He's not Jewish, but maybe he could play a Jewish man. And in the, in the he, he just loves. He always loves like tweeting out that one uh, yeah, image yeah. or in that in that movie. Um, there's a lot to a lot to work with there. A lot of like a, a large, a large uh, array of options of, of Adam Sandler, uh, Adam Sandler stuff. And then I guess we're not even talking about SNL stuff because it's not a movie. But there's 50 first dates. I don't know. We could go on and on about this. Final question. 50 first dates are great. He has some. He has some really good movies and some really like really not good movies. Yeah, wasn't like Little Nicky anyway. one of his movies where he's like yeah. Him. No, like anybody yeah. else, Ruby Halloween was another recent. It was just bad. Yeah, just he got bad. a couple of stinkers, like everybody else, but mostly, mostly good yeah. stuff. Um, final question here from ninety-seven five, the fanatics. Pat Egan, again, one of our loyal listeners. Uh, similar question. Uh, well, not too similar, but along the lines of uh, Adam Sandler here. Aaron McKee makes an appearance in the movie Hustle. Pick two former Temple athletes to appear in your movie, and he he came up with some mock titles here. Dante, please don't be offended. This is Pat was texting with me earlier, and I I wasn't sure if you were going to be on the podcast, so he did not include you in his in his uh, mock up titles here. And these are the titles that he came up with, and they're all just little digs at us or references to like, things we've said in the past. The first one is, and this is for me, John. Is there any way for us in America to watch the John DeCarlo story? That is a reference to me tweeting at the drummer from NXS, a band that I loved growing up, and I thought that the guy was going to answer me back. Kyle got a big kick out of it. He will like it, unlike it, and then like it a year later just to bring it back in. So um, there's that. I forgot your lava cakes in my car, the Kyle Gauss story. Analytics are trash, the Javon Edmonds story. (laughs) Sam, you read this last one. (laughs) This is a good one. This is a good one. I don't want to read. I wasn't sure when I saw this. I wasn't sure if you wrote these. After I read this one, I was like, did he write these? No, Pat wrote these. these. You read it. Uh, it says, let's go back to the future. I mean, my place, the Sam Cohn story, <laughs> which is spectacular. That's too yes. good. Um, I, I'll, I'll ask Pat to come up with one for, for Dante. Um, two it's former, two Temple, former athletes Temple athletes in your movie. Well, I think he's saying to pick two former Temple athletes to appear in your movie. Uh... Is this the Owl Scoop movie or is this our individual movies? I think it's our individual movies. So I would actually... Uh, is it a biopic or are we just like, you know, know, putting something together? I don't know. Could be. I think we'll just we'll just go with it. I would say, and it might be recency bias, one of them will be Mark Jackson because he is he's such a huge personality. Um, I, I'd go with Mark Jackson. I think he would be an, I think he'd be a great actor. Very funny. Terrific athlete. Just a big, a big personality. And maybe I go football here. Um, I think I could see I could see Tyler Matakavich mixing it up in a in a in a movie. I think he he'll be a, a character. He was a scrappy guy, two star guy. Had no offers. He's always a great interview. He's very funny. Or no, I think you got to go. I think I got to go. Mark Jackson and Deion Dawkins. And it would be a comedy. Mm. It would absolutely be a comedy. They'd both be hilarious. Those are my two picks. The Kyle Gauss. I, I know Kyle's not here. We'll skip him. Analytics are trash. The Javon Edmonds story. I don't know how much Pat, Pat wants to tie us in with the with the the title here, but Javon, just think out loud on this one. A, a two former Temple athletes to appear in your in your movie about hating analytics. Okay. 
I have two different combinations. I got a new school one and an old school one. I like uh, Okay, so the old one, I'd put Eddie Jones and Mark Karcher. Um, Ooh. You know, I just need a Laker and a Baltimorean. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the new one, I'd pick two hometown guys. I'd take Quincy Roche and Dre Perry. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so I think I could. Uh, eventually left as transfers. Maybe they come yeah. back. Maybe the plot line is they miss home. They want to come back. It, something like that. Uh, I think I could get something good out of them. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, those are my two groupings. Sam? I think I'm going to go with assuming that my, uh, my movie is about time travel <laughs> and things happening throughout time and stories of that nature. What a line. Uh, assuming my movie is about, <laughs> pause for effect, time travel. <laughs> <laughs> um, it with a with a I'm gonna, the flux capacitor in the background. Uh, I'm going with uh, one one combination, one older player and one uh, newer player. I'm going to go with Caleb Battles, my newer player, because, and Bill Pickles, uh, and Bill Pickles Kennedy. <laughs> wow, that's a great pick. Uh, no, I was going to go that old, um, Mike Vrieswick, because Mike Vrieswick is probably if not top five, top two best storytellers in all yep. of Temple basketball uh, lore. Dante, we don't have a working title for you, but we're not leaving you out of this. Uh, two, two, Temple, two former Temple athletes to appear in your movie. Let's say your movie is about just like finding guys on the recruiting trail, finding the next two or three star that becomes a future pro. Hilarity ensues. There's some drama, everything. I don't know. I don't want to hand me in too much. Maybe you bring a, a basketball player into this. Yeah. Um, I want William Quenku definitely because I want to film the scene of him screaming in the shower that he told us about when we were at pro day. Um, I, I think that he would be like a very good, like awkward comedian, you know, cause he's like kind of a, like a goofy guy, but he's also like very serious and very smart. So I think he would be great. How many different um, languages does he speak? A lot. I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's a bunch. So I think he'd be like a really good blend of like very intelligent, but also goofy. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that, I don't know if I was going like pure, like business demeanor guy for football, like at least for me again, only picking from recent history, because those are the only guys I've actually talked to. Um, Like Matt Hennessy was always just very like, you know, the strict like button up guy. Now he might not be that like that. So like maybe, you know, when you're behind closed doors, but with us in the media and on the football field, he was always like really diving into football and wanting to talk about scheme and stuff like that. So I feel like him and Quenku would be like a very good balance of guys that, that could play off each other. So I don't know. Those are the two that, that came off the top of my head. Okay. I'll say this. Gotcha. I saw this guy walking around campus one day and he just reminded me so much of like just somebody's uncle. And I think, like, I could just write him into being a funny character. Mark Macon could be, like, the funny oh, uncle gosh, of one of the yes, main yes, characters. Yes, oh, yes, yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Macon yeah. Macon is – Mark Macon is – Mark Macon is the kind of guy you want on, like, uh, on Zach Galifianakis between two firms. Yes, you do. Yes. Yes, yes I like, love that's it. Where you want, <laughs> that's where you want Mark Macon. I love it. I love it. Macon is – a character, huge, huge, huge character. Nobody would, nobody would dispute that. That's a Javon. That's a great, great, great call by you. There's one He's more fantastic. here. I don't, I don't want to leave out. Um, from Sean McGee, our buddy who runs the I'll be back podcast. Uh, his mailback question here comes in from Twitter, the I'll be back account. If you had the money to buy the space where the draft horse was, what bar or type of bar would you put there? We know that it already has been purchased, so there's going to be a, a replacement there. But if you had the money to buy the space where the draft horse was, what bar or type of bar would you put there? I would build a uh, nostalgia draft horse bar. So like very similar to the draft horse, <laughs> but it's a nostalgia bar. <laughs> you would call it... Because the- that's... What- you would call it the craft horse and it would be full of craft beers and it would look exactly like the draft horse. Exactly. Exactly. Even have to That's what people, people want old, people want old times. People want to come back to college and be like, I remember when I was here, however many years ago. Dante, Javon. <sighs> this is a tough one. I didn't see this one, so I did not come prepared. Um, I'm just trying to keep you on your toes. I'm just trying yeah, to. Yeah, you're really throwing. Like, yeah, just oh, thrown into a, a drill. 
want to see your footwork. I want to see a back pedal here. <laughs> I don't know. I can only think of cop out answers. Uh, and I, and I was trying to be creative. My, my, my first cop out thought was just a bar that plays all 22 on loop, um, mm -hmm. as like a, a very like cop out answer for me. I'll, I'll pass it to Javon and I'll see if I can come up with something a little bit more creative. Yeah, I, I guess I'd make like Temple's version of, of Bernie Mac's rest, uh, bar on, on Mr. 3000, like just mm -hmm. a straight up Temple sports bar. Like, I don't know. So all the retired jerseys, let's get those hung up. All the like stars on campus at the moment, the Caleb Battles and the Mir Tylers of the world, let's get their jersey put up there. And um, yeah, we know the Temple fan base right now isn't always the biggest uh, – fan of going down to the link okay walk around the corner to whatever we're going to call this call this bar and and you got a reason to get drunk and be able to walk home afterwards so there you go yeah to to javon's point i think that makes the most sense make it a temple like make it a temple temple bar if that's what you're trying to get for alumni or whatever because i mean chris clark always tells a story about when he was uh when he was younger the um in wendy's i don't know if it was always a wendy's but they're all the pictures on the wall of Temple basketball, John, yeah. John, yeah, they're still there. Sure yeah. Else, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure who else is still on the wall. I don't know if it was always a Wendy's, but he said like growing up, he remembers always seeing that wall and like, that's what you should have in a temple bar to lure alumni back. What I would do partly purely for selfish reasons. I think it might flame out in a couple of years because it's maybe too specific. This is half cheesy. I think it could work. Call it like the cherry and white cafe with like, checkered tablecloths like an old school italian place like red gravy but like play off of the red yeah, thing yeah. you could have like a cherry cherry and white blush like vodka cream sauce like a bunch of like pasta nope. dishes but i'm thinking like nope, yeah pictures it. around nope. no what'd you say <laughs> i said no i hate it <laughs> Why? Because we I mean, Sterling Temple is on deck by the we way could have we're talking red drinks we could have glu yeah gluten-free pasta for sam uh, a lot of red wine. <laughs> there would be. <laughs> Wait, can we tell real quick before I get back to my failed uh, concept for this Italian restaurant? I want to tell the story about I, when the day of graduation, I meet Sam's parents within minutes. I'm like, can you please tell me an embarrassing story about Sam and his mother, who's just a lovely human being at first, just not taking the bait. It's like, he was a pretty good kid growing up. I don't really have much. And then at one point, she said something, and I'm probably butchering the story, where she said she wanted to give you some sort of food. And you were like, it has gluten in it. You're like, and, and she said, you're like, are you trying to kill me? <laughs> are you trying to kill me? And there was just a little, a little story about little dramatic Sam trying to paint. I was, uh, I was stubborn when I was little. I will admit, I was, a, I was a stubborn young child. Yeah. Thinking that your parents were trying to, trying to poison you with, with excess gluten. And exactly. when meanwhile, they, they just seems like they've, they've been incredible role models in your life. So, oh, they're fantastic. I think, I mean, I think, I think they're great. So, so I know to expect in next May that John's going to ask my mom an embarrassing story about, oh my God, yeah. I know exactly which story oh, she's yeah. going to tell. And I'm going to come no, no, no. When, next week and, and it's going to be bad. So yeah. you were probably when Javon, when Javon graduates, John is bringing a microphone to meet your parents, yes. spending, getting five, 10 minutes of embarrassing stories oh, to then I imagine play it on the family, pod. <laughs> family is probably- You know who he's going to really want to talk to? My grandparents. Yeah. He's going to have you, fun talking to them. Yes, because Vaughn's, your grandpa- Vaughn's bringing the whole family. Oh, yes, Vaughn's because, bringing 25 plus people to graduation. Your grandfather has excellent musical taste. I would imagine if if you if your family is <laughs> anything like you, they, they're probably great storytellers, very smart, very funny, very nostalgic. So very much looking forward to that. I think- I think my Italian restaurant could work, but we'd have to, you know, we'd, you'd have like your, your pasta dishes. I'd play up a lot of red sauce stuff, red wines, but I'd have to, I'd have to mix up the menu. There would be like a little back cafe and then the bar area would still have to be there. It's so like, you could, I think you could still blend like an old school red gravy place with like the bar, lots of temple stuff, name some pasta dishes after you know, after former temple players and stuff like that, that's what I would do. So I don't know. Hey, Dante, was that enough time? What's that? Uh, it was not because I got 
bothered with something else. But I like John's Italian idea. That sounds like Ooh. a place I would go a lot. Good. It sounds like a restaurant that's that's right up my alley. And nothing to do with the fact that I am a really, really big fan of uh, gluten-filled pasta. What is your favorite, <laughs> what's your favorite, from one fellow Italian to another, what is your favorite pasta dish? Oh, um... I'll make this more aggressive. You may not wake up tomorrow. This might be your last meal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I will go with. Let me, let me let me up the ante here. Yeah, let me go. I'm gonna kill you tomorrow. This is your last. I, nobody pasta. said no, I'm um, killing you. My hands are clean on this. That was the next step. That was the next step, John. Oh, uh, but I can't but, guarantee um, that you shouldn't keep your head on the swivel. Anyway, the point is, <laughs> I, <laughs> I love Dante in no way, shape, or form. Do I know anything about his untimely demise? I sincerely hope you wake up tomorrow. But in this scenario, this might be your last meal. <laughs> um, I'm going to go with, okay, if it's just, like, if pasta is the main component, I think it's rigatoni bolognese for me. Oh, that would thought. be like I'm my... still laughing, John. <laughs> Took his glasses off. You told him to keep his hand on a swivel, John. <laughs> I did. I'm just, I'm hearing things, you know? I'm hearing things. Out I'm here. hearing things. I'm hearing things out here in Havertown. There's, uh, That's uh, funny. Some people who uh, want a piece of Dante, and this might be his last meal. I'd not. That's Reggaeton, but that's a, that's a good call. It's a very, very, very good call. Sam, do you have any favorite gluten-free pastas or no? no. I wouldn't say. I've, no. I mean, uh, Trader Joe's is a very good gluten-free fettuccine, but it's hard to find, like, non-penne spaghetti gluten-free. It's like, you got to, like, really search for it. It's hard to find. A penne, not a huge. I mean, I'll eat it. I'll eat it if it's there. I'm not yes. a huge, yeah. not a huge penne person. Anyway, yeah. Thank, thank you all for the the, the wide array of, of mailbag questions. Um, thank you all for listening to another episode. We'll have more stuff for you in the coming weeks, and uh, hopefully Dante will be with us next week. Just totally kidding. Maybe I wasn't. No. I don't know anything. Don't know anything out there. But thanks for listening to another episode. Hope you guys are having a great week. And we will talk to you soon. Bye.